Patricia Schmidt, who went by Susie, lived with her family in Seacliff, south of Adelaide in South Australia. In December of 1971, 16-year-old Susie had just finished her leaving exam at Seacombe High School a few weeks earlier. Susie dreamed of one day becoming an airline hostess. For the time being, she had taken a job at the Burger King in Darlington so that she would have money to buy Christmas presents for her family. Susie's 10-year-old brother, Frank, had already gotten her a present, which sat wrapped under the family Christmas tree. Tragically, Susie never got to open it. Susie had decided to start requesting late-night shifts because they offered better pay. Friday, December 17, 1971, was only the second such shift she worked. That evening, Susie's father, Werner, dropped her off at the home of her friend Frida around 6 p.m. when he was on his way to the local German club, where he worked part-time as a barman. Around 8.30, Susie and Frida walked to the Burger King so that Susie could start her shift, before Frida left so that Susie could start working. Susie told her that she would see her the next day. Susie finished work around 1.45 a.m. on December 18th. Her father was supposed to pick her up on his way home, but he was running 10 minutes late. Susie decided to walk home rather than wait any longer. Describing his brief delay, Werner Schmidt would later tell the press, a few minutes could have made all the difference. I might have saved my daughter's life. Susie never arrived home and Werner reported her missing at 9.30 that morning, less than eight hours after she was last seen at work. Around 6.30 that evening, an off-duty police officer was driving in Hallett Cove when he thought he saw something amongst the tall grass along the road. When he got closer, he realized it was the body of a young woman. It was Susie Schmidt. When Susie was found, she was wearing only her boots. Her bra was found hanging from a nearby fence, and her jumper and coat had been draped over her body. The kangaroo skin purse she had been carrying was never located. Evidence showed that Susie had been sexually assaulted prior to being murdered, and the battered state of her body showed that she had died a violent death. Susie was buried next to her mother, who had passed away five years earlier. Police believed Susie may have accepted a ride home from her killer. She told a friend that on Tuesday, December 14th, after she worked her first night shift, she had accepted a ride from an unattractive man who was around 30 years old and had severe acne. After Susie got into his car, he suggested that they take a drive to the Adelaide Hills, but Susie said no. He then began driving towards Hallett Cove, but Susie demanded that he drive her home, which he ultimately did. It is unclear if police believe this same man could have potentially given Susie a ride home on the night of her murder, or if he could have been involved in her killing. They cannot say for sure if she willingly accepted a ride or if she was abducted as she walked home. Authorities did have several clues to go on at the scene. They found metal filings from key cutting microscopic particles that could have been from a shoe repair business, byproducts left behind by welding, particles of electric waste from Phillips Industries, which was located in nearby Henley Beach at the time, iridescent blue paint from a 1971 Holden Monaro, and small paint flakes that were pink on one side and white on the other. Following up on these clues did not immediately lead to the case being solved. It would be decades before investigators could properly use additional evidence found at the crime scene, DNA from multiple men. In December of 2021, South Australia police launched a new appeal for information on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of Susie's murder. They also announced a recent major breakthrough that they believed brought them closer to solving the case than they had ever been before. DNA had been found following a new examination of Susie's clothing that had been found with her body. So far, only one of the two DNA profiles found on the clothing has been fully developed, but investigators are already using it to try to identify one of the at least two men responsible for the sexual assault. 
The profile was uploaded to the National DNA Database, but no direct match was found. Investigators then turned to familial searching, which has so far identified eight potential relatives of the suspect. Despite this strong new evidence, the process of building family trees and testing all potential matches will take some time. Police are still hoping for witnesses to come forward with the name of a potential suspect so they can do a direct DNA test, which could potentially allow them to solve the case within a few weeks. A reward of up to $1 million is being offered. For Susie's brother, Frank, the new developments have given him hope that the case will finally be resolved after decades of waiting. He stated, you know, you're better off having some hope and being disappointed than no hope at all. Just after 6 p.m. on March 6, 1974, police in Hopewell Township, Pennsylvania, received a call asking them to report to Lakewood Park. The caller had observed what they initially believed to be a mannequin in a creek running through the park. When the caller got closer, however, they realized that it was, in fact, the partially clothed body of a young woman lying with her face in the water of the creek. The young woman was 23-year-old Annette Tokars. According to Annette's younger sister, Sharon, Annette was exceptionally friendly. She was a very caring person who would give away the last dollar she had if someone else needed it. Annette and Sharon last spoke about a week before Annette died, and Sharon could tell that something was bothering her. Her sister did not confide in her about what was going on that was upsetting her. Injuries to Annette's body indicated that she had been assaulted prior to her death. A wooden club was found during the search of the park, but it was ultimately found not to have been the instrument used to cause Annette's injuries. Annette's cause of death was found to be forceful drowning. Authorities believe she had been attacked and then dragged down to the creek by her killer, who drowned her in just a few inches of water. Investigators believe she may have been unconscious when she was drowned. Police theorized that Annette had willingly gone to the park with her killer. Her autopsy showed that she had sex before her death, but it could not be determined if the sex was consensual or if Annette had been raped. Annette had been seen out in a variety of places throughout the area the night before her body was found. Police interviewed a number of witnesses to track Annette's movements in the final hours of her life. The last sighting of her was in the town of Aliquippa, just a few miles north of the park where Annette's body would eventually be found. She was last seen being driven away in the car of a man who was an acquaintance of hers. For decades, this man was considered by police to be the prime suspect in the case, although they never found enough evidence to charge him with Annette's murder. In 2022, Beaver County Detective Paul Young meticulously went over all of the evidence in Annette's case, hoping to find previously overlooked clues that could be used to further the investigation. Using an alternative light source, he located DNA evidence in what would later be described to the media as an appropriate area of Annette's clothing, opening up a possible avenue to solving the case. The DNA had degraded since 1974, and the profile that was developed from Annette's clothing was not complete enough to run through the combined DNA index system. Investigators were able to directly compare the profile to samples taken from potential suspects. The main suspect in the case, the acquaintance Annette had last been seen with, had since passed away. However, one of his relatives did provide a voluntary DNA sample. Testing on it showed that the main suspect could not have been the contributor of the DNA. The DNA was then compared to samples from a suspected local serial killer, as well as known sex offenders who were active at the time of the murder in the area. No matches were found. While the DNA profile is not complete enough to run through the criminal database, it is complete enough to attempt to use genetic genealogy to determine who the DNA belongs to. 
Crime Solvers of Beaver County has agreed to provide the funds for this testing. Hopefully, the effort will soon identify Annette's killer. Fifty-six-year-old John Lazaro lived in Rochdale, a suburb south of Brisbane. On April 11, 2012, he was in the living room of his home when two masked men burst inside and shot him multiple times. His 19-year-old daughter witnessed the shooting, but was not harmed during the attack. She was able to immediately call for help, but despite her quick action, her father did not survive his injuries. John's dog a Rottweiler mix named Kilo, was also shot during the attack, but survived after undergoing surgery. Police would later describe John's murder as a brutal execution. While his murderers clearly targeted him, investigators could find no motive for the crime, despite interviewing more than 150 individuals in connection to their investigation. Years went on without an arrest in John's case. Police made a renewed appeal to the public for information in April of 2022, on the 10th anniversary of John's murder. At this time, they also released CCTV footage, taken near John's home at the time of the murder. The footage shows a trayback utility vehicle speeding away. The footage was taken less than 100 yards away from John's home, just moments after the time he was shot. Due to how quickly the vehicle left the scene, investigators believe that at least three people were involved in the crime, the two shooters and a getaway driver. A major break in the case came just months later, in June of 2022, when authorities announced that they had located the gun used to kill John. Ballistics testing had confirmed that it was the weapon used in the case. The firearm in question was an unregistered Browning 1900 32 caliber semi-automatic. The 45-year-old man from New South Wales, who had been in possession of the gun, was questioned by authorities, and his home was searched. The weapon had been in the possession of numerous individuals since 2012, making it difficult to tie it to the person responsible for John's murder. However, Detective Acting Inspector Daniel Cunningham has stated that the discovery of the weapon has accelerated the investigation. Inquiries into the various individuals who had been in possession of the weapon are ongoing. When announcing the discovery of the gun, Queensland Police also stated that they now believe that the shooters had ties to the Bandidos Outlaw Motorcycle Gang. John himself was not involved with the gang. Investigators are hoping that the quickly shifting loyalties amongst gangs like the Bandidos will result in someone with information finally coming forward. There is a $500,000 reward being offered for information that ties all of the new clues and information together to finally solve John's case.